Welcome back to Beards and Brews. Hey, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Not only does it help us out, you'll know exactly when we have another one brewing. Gentlemen, we are wrapping up Segaluary with Under Siege 2, colon, Dark Territory. Now, may not be as well regarded as previous iteration, but this was a lot of fun. We have Con Hair, a.k.a. <laughs> Uncle Segal, out oh of the God. shadows. This is the most I've seen this man in natural lighting Ever. Yes, that's very true. Like, the movie does go out of its way, like, when he's not moving, to put him in shadow in, like, broad-ass daylight. But, like, you're absolutely right. Like, this is the most well-put-together Steven Seagal movie, which is weird to say. So we've had Die Hard on a boat. We've had Die Hard on a... I don't remember the rest of those movies, but they were all basically... <laughs> it's, it's all the same. <laughs> they were all Whatever. basically Die Hard somewhere. This is Die Hard on a train, am I right? A hundred percent. But like this one in particular is like legitimately under siege too. Like it's the same movie just with the location flip. We are missing Gary Busey in drag though, which I feel like was a <laughs> crucial part to the original under siege. He was replaced by the curly haired villain who honestly was my favorite person in this. Speaking of favorite yeah. person, can we please discuss who you thought was the worst in this movie? The worst? Ooh, yes. Oof. The tall order. It's either going to be Steven Seagal's niece or oh. that guy who's just like, huh, you guys need a hero, and then gets immediately decked by Steven Seagal. I don't know. I kind of think they're all flying on about the same level to me. I mean, Steven Seagal is being his best stone statue who is also a hero somehow. Yeah, uh, you, you've got all these guys that are just 90s bad guys, mm -hmm. which, I mean... There's a time and a place for that, and that time and place is obviously right here. <laughs> Can we give yeah. it up for the bad guys, though? Because the curly-haired bad guy, the nerd fella, he was my favorite because he's trying. He's having, just, yep. he's having fun with the material. Mm -hmm. It's all technobabble bullshit, but he knows oh, it. Shit. I have him down as not Paul Reiser, by the way. I don't know if you guys... <laughs> we're going to oh, refer yeah. to him as not Paul Reiser. At least I am. So I'm going to give him a strong Anthony Bourdain. Oh, why you got to do my boy like that? To me, the worst one was Dramatic Smoker Guy. Ooh, oh, which... yeah. The guy who was just like, he wasn't even using the cigarette. He just like put it up to his mouth. It's like, man, if I do this, I'll look cool and totally not useless. Like, I remember that scene and I remember thinking, is that guy even smoking that? Hell but no. I don't remember even who he was. He's holding it literally at the very 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 tips of his fingers like kiss puffing on it it's so fucking weird and they it, they show him at least 10 times in this movie doing that so just to get the plot out of the way it's extremely thin of course steven seagal's at the wrong place right time or however you want to spin it terrorists hijack the train that he's just on or whatever those terrorists used to work for the government the government screwed them over they want their revenge and some nerdy guy looks at some titties enhance yeah, that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this fucking, this super satellite from outer space, you can, like, pinpoint a, a lady on a beach in, like, Santa Monica or whatever, and it's just like, enhance, enhance, enhance. Yes. It's like a pervy episode of CSI or something. It's so weird and out of place in its own mm -hmm. context because they have this powerful thing. Fucking weirdo zooms in on this poor lady just getting a tan, and everyone in the room is oblivious to what's in front of them. They're just like, God damn, this is the best satellite. <laughs> and that's it. Even Red Foreman or Florence Boddicker's over there just like, God damn, look at this satellite. <laughs> Can we discuss how wasted he was in this movie? Fuck. He was wasted completely. And not as in like, uh, he was not under the influence. He was just there and just a, a body. He was just yeah. a body. I mean, that's fine. Like, I could see it on his face. I'm sure you guys saw it too. He let that paycheck just fall right into his hands and just whatever. Oh yeah, 100%. Steven Seagal, what a dumbass. <laughs> Yeah, but no, the idea, you're right. Uh, Steven Seagal going to take a little vacation with his niece whose parents blew up in a plane crash. Uh, yeah, and that's like the first taste of abrupt violence. Because yeah. <laughs> even the way he explained it was just like, wow, this should be like on the news or something. And he's like, don't worry about it, kid. I'm going to take you on this uh, vacation. And you don't even have to worry about your parents being hamburger no more. 
it was such a vanilla exposition dump of just like, yeah, the parents died in a plane crash, and but everything's okay now. I don't know what they look like. I'm going to go to the train station and see if I can find them. I started laughing so hard whenever he fucking rolled into that train station <laughs> dressed like Desperado. <laughs> like, there's no way to cover my gut in here. I guess I'm just going to wear jet black and hopefully not make eye contact with anybody. Don't look at anyone directly in the eyes. Look for the young girl whose whole future is plot exposition. But the uh, the niece, the number two in this film, played by young Catherine Heigl, or have her, her last name is pronounced Heigl, right? Mm-hmm. Heigl? Catherine yeah. Heigl. She's, I don't know, she's a person. That she is. Uh, but no, I, th- I think she does fine in this. Like, par for the course compared to everybody else, honestly. I have a lot of theories about this movie. Mm-hmm. Well, any Steven Seagal movie during production because it definitely feels like for the first 20 minutes she was legitimately just not wanting to be around steven seagal and that comes across like either character wise and also personally but then like after that i don't know 20 25 minute mark it's almost like every line she read was at gunpoint yes i mean was it not if you notice everyone who is in a scene with steven seagal has that exact same (laughs) reaction no matter if it's the villain the people who were supposed to be sucking his dick, whatever. <laughs> they're just like, oh my God, it's Casey Ryback. Mm-hmm. And then they're oh, on God, the screen yeah. with him like, oh, it's Casey Ryback. Thanks for saving me, Steven Seagal. <laughs> yeah, basically. So speaking of sucking dick, <laughs> now we don't need to transition like that. Did you so, sum this movie up that quick? <laughs> so that yeah. was Under Siege too. Yeah, it, it kind of sucks a little dick. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Like it's a fucking... <laughs> Nathan's package of wieners like you can say it's fine (laughs) now don't do my boy Nathan's like that they make some fine sausages but speaking of fine sausages what is going on with this couple in like the last train cart who are they and why are they important why do we need to see them having sex can I cover this because I was very excited to see (laughs) not ScarJo not Fred Savage Having sex yes. with golden oldies until some Man. random henchman comes in and shoots just the radio. It like, looked like a pretty nice boombox for 1995, too. <laughs> I mean, this is Steven Seagal movie's version of just, like, comedy. There's a lot of that in this movie, by the way. Like, I know Glimmer Man was, like, they were pissing around with stuff. But in this movie, I feel like they were, like, legitimately trying to make a 90s action movie with or without Steven Seagal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm right there with you. Like, there's not a lot of comedy, but there are a lot of instances where, like, one comedic thing happens. Did Did you guys find it comedic or absurd? Yes. Whenever, once again, he was the cook on this train for whatever fucking reason. And everyone's like, oh, it's Casey Ryback. Everyone knows him. He's a cook. Let him cook on your train. What does he cook, gentlemen? This man Dude. microwaves a fucking cake. He does. He totally does. And what I found entrancing was that, like, when he poked in the numbers in the microwave before he hit start he did like a fucking wizard's whoosh with his hand just to turn it on (laughs) well i mean you got to go from microwaving a bomb to microwaving a bomb ass cake right (laughs) oh come on man and again a parallel that will happen later (laughs) you're talking about microwaving and microwaving this motherfucker makes a bomb out of nothing again (laughs) it's the same scene from the first one where he took apart Mm -hmm. that missile yeah, but this time instead of a bomb, he's taking apart a cocktail shaker like Tom Cruise. He gives the man a pager that says "fuck you," and he's like, oh, "I'm on fire now." Dude, yeah, there's that's literally. The best shit. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's literally like a Motorola pager attached to it. This is peak 1995, guys. But that "fuck you" beeper is brilliant. It just doesn't belong in a Steven Seagal movie. It's too fucking good. <laughs> it needed to scroll over, like leave it on "fuck you" for just a second, and then motherfucker. Like, <laughs> yes, it, it scrolls in. <laughs> it's 100% taken out of Last Action Hero. Yeah, it needed a little bit more of that, though, I feel like. It needed to be a little bit more self-referential, a little bit more self-aware. It was almost there. This is the closest to a real movie that Steven Seagal's ever gotten to. And that's okay. because I do have a running theory that there are two movies. So there is Under Siege 2. That's the movie that Steven Seagal showed up to shoot. That's the movie the director humored him with through this entire thing. And then the other half is Dark Territory, or it's, it is the hostages, it is the bad guys, it is the Pentagon, because nobody wanted to fucking be around Steven Seagal. <laughs> you know, that might check out, actually. Yeah, I can see that. Think about it, like, half the movie, everybody's doing their own thing, totally fluid, 
doesn't make the best sense. Whatever. Bad guys are having fun. And then the other half is legitimately Steven Seagal just snooping around a train with the worst gun handling on the face of the planet. Dude. You're talking about the gun handling. He gets shot and then he goes into the fucking train car with that the bagger boy. And he's like, oh my God, you're shot. He goes, this is shot. You think this is shot? <laughs> This ain't shot. He's like, bro, you just got shot through the fucking chest with a sniper rifle. Yeah, no, I wrote that down. It's like he gets shot with a sniper rifle through like the shoulder and he's like, oh, you think I'm shot? I disagree. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's Steven Seagal just has cheat codes. Like in the fucking movie, they wrote the character for development gets shot. And Steven Seagal is like, oh, yeah, we can do that scene. Well, what happens next? I'm not shot. Why? Not shot. I don't know. I found a potion. Dude, it's exactly yeah. like being a kid and playing tag and be like, I got you. No, you didn't. I didn't see nothing. I was on base. No, base is over there. Base is right here, motherfucker. <laughs> can't, can't we do like a parody where everyone shoots Steven Seagal, but the bullets hit them? Oh, all right. So we got this whole crew on board. They stop this train, hijack it. They got this whole crew on board, probably like, what, 20 something men. And they load all of these like cases full of something on board. It's a bunch of like, like you said, techno babble, brouhaha. That's what it is. But there's a whole lot of equipment coming with it. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing just serves the purpose of showing how smart the main bad guy is. Like he just everything is just an ad for whatever rolls through the door. It's like, oh, this is a P-1000, the most powerful bullshit in the world. Oh, look at that. That runs on a whole gig of RAM. <laughs> Aside oh. from using the two captains who you brought up earlier to get codes to activate this machine. That's what there they're is there no, for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. There is no reason for him or anyone else to be on this train. They could have relayed the codes and then had all of this shit because it wasn't a lot of stuff just in a van. Yeah. Yeah, they could have done it remotely because this whole thing was remote. Like, that was the whole reason to put on the train, yeah. to keep it moving. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Didn't need to be there. <laughs> he could have actually been in France when he called the Pentagon. Yeah, the you got to keep it moving, and you got to eventually, at some point, be in that uh, that territory, which is dark. <laughs> anyway, so they... <sighs> they got these captains who were in the back uh, the back train car in the caboose, you know. <laughs> getting some caboose, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. Eric, doing Segaluary, Chandler, you're probably going to be right there with me. In all of his movies, there's so many unfinished ideas, so many things scattered around that never, you know, circulate back into the movie, but seem important at the time, like mm -hmm. the teddy bear. Oh, yeah, yeah, there was that teddy bear. Forgot about that one. It's just the way his movies are kind of constructed. Like, his movies are reliably 90 minutes. And the, <laughs> they always start fairly strong. And then by like the 70 minute mark, they're just like, ooh, we're just going to have to cut this turd off right now. It's just they, they just start unraveling into a little bit of chaos. Yeah, yeah. always. Like, and this, this is this is no different at all. No, no, no. Like I brought up the, the spike in violence. And man, every fucking time I, I, I don't know, man, like... <laughs> Like, they are violent films for sure, but this really brings it up in the level of, like, graphic violence. Like, we have a, a scene a little bit later where Seagal and another guy are sort of fighting on top of one of the train cars. Seagal kicks him off oh, in, front of, in front of the train, onto the train tracks, and it just fucking rolls him over. It's right up there with Jaws when Quint gets eaten. Oh, it's brutal. It is. That man was eaten by a train. <laughs> it's It's... You can see him like ping pong ball bouncing up and down between the tracks and the train going <laughs> as more and more of him is eaten away. And then Steven Seagal is just like hunched over, just looking at him just like, yeah. Like that would have been a good opportunity for one of his one liners. OK, speaking of one liners, he had one that had me on the ground again, just laughing because those uh, two captains, they give up the codes, of course, uh -huh. you know, so they're useless bad guys like just chuck them out whatever the train's going over a bridge they'll just fall in the valley never to be seen again and when they chuck the lady she immediately turns into a mannequin that's fine yes. and the, but then the movie's just like well man steven seagal's got to show some kind of compassion this was actually really violent the cuts to him crouched down on top of the train he's just god damn it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's so quiet it's so quiet um i'm two, two, two movie theory eric the bad guy his ultimate weapon 
the big plot device here is a laser in space. And he wants one billion dollars or he's going to start blowing things up. I absolutely yes. wrote that wrote that down. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he has that laser, but they don't know if they want it to be under siege to laser beam or the dark territory earthquake beam. Yeah, you're right. It does kind of go back and forth. Like, is this like a thing that blows things up or is this a thing that makes earthquakes? Also, if this is a thing that makes earthquakes, why? Um, well, it's a plot oh. device because it is like a doomsday weapon, but Ooh, the movie... it's a plot device. <laughs> yes, but the movie and the characters give zero shit about the power that they harness. Because, like, even the bad guy with the curly hair, he's just like, man, I got so much to do, all these numbers to run, blow up the Pentagon, all kinds of stuff. Where's my laundry? Like, okay. Someone calls him completely unrelated to anything in the movie. I feel like this dude just ad-libbed this. He goes, oh, who's on the phone? General Akbar. He's like, oh, what's he want? He said if you blow up that plane, he'll give you an extra $100 million. And he's oh, like, yeah. let's fucking do it. And they yeah. cause a quote-unquote earthquake in the air. Damnedest thing I've ever seen. And we get a visual of swirling colors. What they show you is basically... What the predator sees when he shoots yeah. down a plane. It just goes into like this weird thermal vision that everybody's just like, wow. By the way, $100 million just to kill his ex-wife. I get it. I get it. But that is a lot of money. I feel well, like he... you can get that done for cheaper, right? <laughs> I, I think the idea here is just to kind of flex, you know, like this is what we can do at any moment. You don't even know where the satellite is. Right. So, like, their first big flex was there was this fertilizer plant in Guangzhou, China, that was evidently just like a weapons manufacturer. And they're like, you know what? Mm -hmm. We're going to blow that up. So they blow it up. Like, I thought that was going to be the big thing. I thought it was going to be like, yeah, this is going to kill 100 million people. And they just blow it up immediately. The way the information is relayed, it's very disastrous. You know, it's like, yeah, they blow up this facility and the the movie kind of goes out of its way to kind of show you like a model getting blown up. It's like, oh, it's just the factory. But from the map's point of view, it looks like they fucking wiped China off the face of the earth. And yeah, everybody's just yeah. like, huh. Yeah, basically, Guangzhou, China is uh, obliterated. And he's threatening to do the same thing to the Pentagon because for some reason there's a nuclear reactor under the Pentagon. Cue Mr. Nervous Man faking the cigarette. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Angry smoking it. And we have two admirals who have been called in since this satellite has gone rogue. And they Correct. are the same fucking dudes from the table last time who were sucking that Ryback D. Yeah. <laughs> well, this time, like, the uh, the older fella, he, like, he's a legitimate actor. Like, he was, like, you know, he walks in, he felt like an official. Like, he works the room the way you would feel like a guy like that would. But then, like, as soon as he finds out who's on the train, he's just, like, the guck ga gucks Casey Ryback. It's, oh, Casey Ryback's there? Boys, sit down, put your feet up, we're in for a treat. <laughs> yeah, you know what they should have been doing, though? All these guys sitting around the Pentagon with the word that the Pentagon is going to get blown up? They should have fucking left the Pentagon. Just a thought, like, they might not have been able to get more than, you know, they've got several hours here. They could get pretty far away, right? Yeah, it's right. handled, don't worry about it. It's just like a countdown to... I don't know, Hero Seagal. You're right. You're right. Why would I ever doubt him? The next piece that we get is this amazing, and by amazing, I mean laughably, ridiculously, unbelievable fucking shootout scene where everybody, there's like fucking nine dudes trying to shoot an unarmed Steven Seagal. He manages to work his way into this fold of men and get a <laughs> pistol. He then dispatches all of them until some sniper wolf lady shows up, shoots him through the shoulder blade. He falls under the train. He should be quote unquote hamburger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it pans underneath and he's just fucking hanging there. Like, no. It's so weird, right? <laughs> because like this dude is clearly not in the best shape and he's kind of a clunky kind of dude. And, like, the bad guys, they like, see a little bit of blood from his gunshot wounds. Like, yeah, he's, he's, he's fucking toast. Let's go tell the other bad guy. That is and, like, not blood. That is strawberry syrup. That is chili jam. <laughs> it is something other than blood, but I guarantee it's sugar-based. 
<laughs> he just cuts the Steven Seagal hanging on the bottom of the train with like a, a thing of Heinz ketchup. <laughs> God, I'm good. No, it's a oh. jelly donut. It just squeezed out the back end. It's because he's a cook. He's just got something stashed on him at all times. So when he gets shot, they're like, oh, he's bleeding everywhere. Nah, that's my Tabasco sauce. Is it because he's a cook <laughs> or because he's a fat ass? <laughs> I mean, synonymous at this point. Is this before or after the fucking the stealth bombers come in and are all swooping in and that's when the earthquake in midair happens? This is right it's after, before. right? Is it's it before? Are you, talking, are you talking about the clearly foam model stealth airplane? That I am. By the way, if we haven't mentioned it, there's a lot of really bad uh, attempts at effects going on. Uh, there's oh, there's a, a lot of green screen that just it's shouldn't be in here. Yeah, it's a lot. It's like basic stuff, too. Like These aren't even like masterful like ilm level effect it's just legitimately outside the window like it's like anything passing yep. by is green screened in because like i guess they couldn't afford to run the train for an extra two days dude you sending all those little clips or screenshots of steven seagal on top of the train peeking through a window <laughs> were fucking great because it translates so well to the movie because every time you would send one i went the fuck is he doing and then when you see him in the movie do it you go why the fuck is he doing it? Yeah, he's like snooping around. Like after the gunfight, like he goes from under the thing. He's back on top of the train, snooping in on bad guys, peeking in. And of course, we mentioned the awful green screen effect. So you have this large, stiff man trying to just like peek in the window upside down like Spider-Man, clearly in view of these bad guys. And it's almost like the bad guys are like trying to turn the back to him. Just like, yeah, we're doing bad guy stuff. What's that? Oh, oh woo, man, that's a birder bug or something. Somebody should shut that window. <laughs> it's, a, it's a seagull. It's a seagull. Ah! Yes! <laughs> He's just like, coo coo, motherfucker. Oh, god damn. We're talking about him like peeping through the windows. You know what would be great? Is if somebody could CGI him into Pumpkinhead. And in the scene where Pumpkinhead walks by the window, instead it's just Steven Seagal lumbering by. <laughs> <laughs> He's just got that flappy run just like going by. <laughs> Now listen, we're talking about his his like his gait or whatever you want to call it, and that's listen. He is a man of short burst action, so when yeah. he gets a hold of somebody, he doesn't need much. He's gonna alt on you. He's gonna bring out the. He's gonna take your arm, wrap it around your body, and uh, point that gun right up underneath your chin and blow your head off. It gets you need like one point two seconds for that to happen, and you're done. Who cares how fast he walks? I feel like at the same time he was training his Aikido stuff, he was also working like at the pretzel joint at the mall. And somehow there's like this weird intertwiny thing. You think he's more of a, an Auntie Anne's or like a Wetzel's pretzels kind of guy? Oh, Auntie Anne's. I get that. But given how stiff he is, rolled gold. Mm. Okay. <laughs> now, he's back on this train and they put it together that Steven Seagal's on this train for what reason? Ah, oh, he's got a plus one. Who is it? It's this chick with the Navy fucking cross. Yeah. She's all doing the same shit as everyone else, which is heartbreaking. Oh, my God. My dad, her literal dad, earned this Navy cross. But it doesn't matter because my uncle has like a bazillion of them. No, he's just a cook. But let me take off my jacket. And here's my 39 purple hearts. Excuse me, 40. I just got taken out by a sniper. <laughs> oh, my God. Every time he gets shot, it just turns into a purple heart. Yeah, then, then, there. then after a while, he just has like a mail of them. Mm. <laughs> That's his cheat That's code right there. Yep. So during all this, like there's several instances where they, the bad guys could have gotten him. They're faked like, out a few times. It's like, oh, we got him. Did you see a body? That's you know, like the running gag. He's we like, got did him, you though. see the body? And they're like, well, I mean, I saw him fall off. It's pretty cut and dry there, boss. And the boss is like, did you see your fucking body? That was Casey Ryback. Casey fucking Ryback. It's a fucking Casey Ryback mixer. And then it <laughs> yeah, basically. And, doing it. and the bad guy with the almost mauve looking hair or whatever, he gets so excited mm -hmm. when he finds it out. He's like, go out there and get him. And I half expect it to when like, his goons run away and you see him like in full frame that he just had like a huge heart on. Okay, Dude. are you talking about like the, the tall bad guy? Like, there's pretty much three main bad guys and one of them... Okay, which... I'm talking about the you know the full grown man with the eight year old boy haircut, not Rutger Hauer. There you go. Gotcha. All right. We haven't really mentioned this Porter guy much, have we? He's there like immediately as soon as he gets on the train. Yeah. A, a little bit trying to flirt with the niece, but 
eventually he becomes like Steven Seagal's right hand man kind of guy just because like he's alive and away from all the the hostages. He's like hiding somewhere. Yeah, he, he's this movie's cake stripper. There you yeah, go. There you go. Yeah. He he just he has to become Steven Seagal's grasshopper because that's just every movie. Yeah, or maybe in this movie he's a little bit of uh, Steven Seagal's like short round because he's doing some <laughs> Indiana Jones stuff in this. Did you guys notice the score at certain points? It is very like kids bop Indiana Jones. I do have to hand it to the score though because it gives the scenes of Steven Seagal doing absolutely jack shit a little bit of life because like he'll just walk through a door or like jump through like a little vent and that's the whole scene. It's like 10 seconds him just walking into a new location. Yep. It's like aggressive walking the movie. <laughs> that's all he can do like when he's trying to be stealthy quote unquote he just like awful gun care of course it's against his chest and he just kind of like saunters through a train car looking behind him haphazardly did they see me of course not i'm the best there's only one way like it's a fucking train there's only one way to get from a to b it's a straight line and they're like i don't know where he's at the whole movie yo he's not in front of us he's not he's not out the window not out that other window either well, he can't be on top of the train. That's just preposterous. Hard cut yeah. to him flail running on top of it. Oh, my God. Yes. And so, like, hard cuts to him up on top of the train, and you see that they're talking to a Tom Hanks fucking hobo character. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, no, it's just the guy with a beard. All the same one from Hard to Kill. Yeah. He's supposed to be like oh. his, um... Like his inner whatever, he's just talking to his mind. What are you doing up here, Seagull Claws? He's like making a list, checking it twice. Yeah, he he eventually makes it to what is it? It's not like the the very front, like the what what do you even call that? I guess it's like a conductor's quarters or whatever. But like there you, go. you have like half of these guys look like legitimate goons. Like, they look pretty weighty. But then, like, the other half, they just look like old retirees or whatever. And yep. then you got Steven Seagal just, like, bursting the door looking extra stout. Speaking of extra stout, what I've got here today is a classic from Guinness. This is their extra stout. It's 5.6% alcohol by volume. This is out of uh, Dublin, Ireland, if you didn't know already. Uh, this is a step up from their traditional Guinness draft stout. A little bit more body to it. Smells a little bit more chocolatey than their their standard brew. Does have a good little bit more of that chocolate, a little bit more of that malt. Not as sweet as I expected, and the traditional Guinness does have a good bit of sweetness, but this does not. Um, this has significantly more flavor than the traditional Guinness draft. This is bold, full of character, lots of malt. There's a good bit of hoppy bitterness in there too. It's not green, it's just there for the bitterness to give that malt a little bit of backbone to stick onto. This is honestly a big step up to me from their traditional Guinness draft. And I don't know why this isn't more popular. I'll tell you, like if it was up to me, I would enter into dark territory more often. Speaking of dark territories, fellas, we made it. They flipped the switch on the rails, the bad guy's plan is all coming together, and they go into this really janky part, which all I can assume is some set somewhere because none of this shit made sense. Sure. Oh my god, are you fucking on point. With this dark territory thing, they they go into some mountains, I guess, and mm -hmm. Casey Ryback gets kicked off the train. Yeah. 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 But luckily there's like a you know, a pickup truck just right here that I can readily steal. So I'm going to do that. It's almost like a video game. Like you're playing Far Cry. Your character gets kicked the shit in back. He's like, I really need to get out of here. Good thing I have this truck with a gun mounted on the back. Yeah, it's right. kind of exactly that. There's no fucking way the rest of this film can ever, ever be taken seriously. This is just so Spinal Tap but it goes to 11, yes. you know? <laughs> like, it totally does. Like, everything from the acting quality getting poorer, like, that's just, like, the surface, but, like, the effects and just, like, how the whole thing is handled is absurd and just, like, so inept. It's almost like everybody quit except for Steven Seagal. Yeah, they called cut, and he just didn't cut. No. He does get a kick off the train, but it's a little crazier than that. Like, he rolls with another dude off a cliff, and they show it, and it's composited so fucking poorly. It didn't even look 3D. It, it just looked like they were just laying on the ground. It looked like the end of RoboCop with that 
Yeah, super long fucking <laughs> arms. Long arms to go. Because I'm the yeah, long arm of the law. Oh. Can can we please? How does how does Seagull get get saved from this situation? He's dangling forty feet down a cliff. His fat ass is hanging on <laughs> by a twig, a fucking literal twig. And some dude rappels down with a gun and says, give me the CD, because he's got a DVD of some really good BDSM porn, and they want nice. And he goes, not on your life, and just leaps on him. <laughs> what the fuck? He has to jump fucking 10 feet from, like, a sheer wall onto a man dangling from a rope. like, And he does it like it's nothing. Steven's stunt double had to jump 10 feet from a set okay. to that guy hanging down. <laughs> Fucking ridiculous. He jumps on this man, takes his gun after beating him to death against the rock wall, shoots another man's rope, sending him to his demise, and then he's just like, yeah. And yeah. now he's in a pickup truck. I don't understand, number one, how this truck is there. Number two, how he has a road. Uh, and number no. three, how he was completely fine after leaping out of this truck going 70 miles an hour and just smashing into <sighs> rocks. Well, if we learned anything from Glimmer Man, it's just that physics just don't work with Steven Seagal. Like, as soon as he left the truck, he was perfectly still. Perfectly all right. True. Yeah, True. and the sort of exit scene for this truck is just like, he yeah. rolls out and the truck just sort of launches like the bus on speed. Yeah, uh, but oh, like, man. It just ramps absurd. over top of that train and back into the What's that, a lake? <laughs> it is absolutely it drives, absurd. It drives into and out of the movie <laughs> in like 10 seconds. It serves the movie pretty much nil because like it even has a gigantically insane exit. Like like you said, it ramps over the train, goes into the river, whatever, and it's huge, bombastic. Actually really cool because it's real. And then it just cuts to Steven Seagal. It cuts to Steven Seagal's stuntman jumping on the train. Yeah, and during all this, there's a whole lot of chaos going on too. With the like, the porter is also off the train, and he's he's now dressed in like somebody's old hoodie that he found yeah. over in the the baggage. And one of the guys corners him, and the bad guy's like, "Hey, don't shoot him. We need that CD. You don't want to run the risk of you know hitting the CD. You could shoot him in the face. He's not carrying the CD on his face. <laughs> it's so fucking ridiculous because like he has a moment of like, I know kung fu. And he dispatches the guy. And I just could not get out of my head that, like, somewhere in a scene that wasn't shown to us in the movie, Steven Seagal peddled his powder deer penis. Oh, dude, oh. yes. It happened. And he fucking, instead of, you know, swallowing it, he snorted that shit and was like, run your pockets, fool. And then he got somebody. <laughs> that line that he threw at him, I'll cap your black ass. Oh, dude, that little guy <laughs> was just, like, absurdly, like, Hollywood racist for no reason. <laughs> he just turned around, did something. Who the fuck wrote that in the script? Who wrote that? I want to see the guy that wrote that in the script. Yeah, dude. And meanwhile, Steven Seagal's niece is trying to defend herself with the only thing she has. Number one, Mace, which the guy's like, it's pepper spray. I eat it like it's fucking horse dick. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then you have his whole teachings culminate in this big moment of her using the club dread orgasm touch on his face. Oh yeah, like I was, I was real. Wor <sighs> what was that? Because she's just like holding her know. finger up to his cheek, and I feel like he's getting a little bit turned on by it. But she's just like, oh, he was yeah. Vulcan death grip, except it's just one finger in your cheek. I kind of assumed that like maybe it's a pressure point or something, and they were just trying to make it look like that was her way out. But yeah, it just totally looked like that bit from Spaceballs where. Uh, he did the Vulcan death grip a little too high. He's like, no, no, a little lower. Yeah. It's the bit where the guy's like, oh, the feng chi, the whatever point. And he pokes Brittany Daniels' characters in the face. She's like, oh, nutted. Oh, <laughs> Club Dread. I thought you were talking about Dread. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Things are much clearer for me now. No, All right, Mama gotcha. <laughs> Lena Hetty isn't popping nuts on slow-mo. That's hilarious, though. Oh. Yeah, I have seen Club Dread. It's been a long time. Man, that movie is bad. Caused the judge to climax. Two years in the ice of cube. <laughs> Did you nut? Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we have the porter, and he's saving the day, and you kind of go, oh, man, someone else is going to get some shine. 
And Steven Skull literally shows him and goes, you think you're the fucking hero? And he's like, what? No, I'm sorry. Don't hurt me. He's like, it's what I thought. <laughs> Somebody being kick-ass in my movie and it ain't me. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> oh, shit. We get semi-climax with him climbing up a ladder to have a showdown with the chick who was able to defeat Steven Skull. And like Eric said earlier, he now knows Seagull Fu. Slings this chick out out of the helicopter like she is nothing one of the toughest characters in the fucking movie is defeated yeah. by a guy who knows nothing oh nothing. yeah yeah you're totally right about her being like one of the most powerful because she's the only one that ever got a shot on steven mm -hmm. yep we forgot to mention at the very very beginning of this film these guys stole a couple of helicopters from a military base somehow they just uh, they find that really sweet spot on the right side of the tunnel you just ramp your car right over the fence Ooh, Bingo. that's a glitch. But yeah, they, they got these helicopters and they're finally coming back, I guess, to save the bad guys, to get them off the train before it goes boom. Yeah, it's their exit strategy. Yeah, I I guess. I guess that works. Yeah, sure. Except, you know, you got guys still alive that can climb up that ladder, too, and throw your sniper rifle lady off or whatever. <laughs> Dude, she was thrown out of the helicopter. I swear to God, it was the best dummy I have ever seen in a film because she has a blood curdling scream on the way down and it's interrupted by the loudest thunk after hitting the train and falling off. No, that's it's actually a really good death scene because she's like, ah, it's almost Titanic worthy, you know, when oh, the guy bounces off the rail. Yeah, she's the propeller guy. Damn. <laughs> Yep. Uh, did you guys notice that, like, whenever he and the, the porter finally regroup together, Seagal does something and the porter's like, you really are a bad motherfucker. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah, How I hard did it. you guys roll your eyes at that one? Yeah, I was going to say, at this point, <laughs> in my mindset, I thought it was brilliant. Just whatever. Take me for the ride of shit. I don't care. <laughs> it was. Dude. That's the most fan service line that I can. Like, that is almost up there with, I've had it with these motherfucking snakes. Come yes. On. But the thing is, the snake line was written for Samuel L. Jackson as like a little bit of like fun. That line that the porter had to fart out was written by Steven Seagal. Oh, 100%. All right. There is one, to me anyways, one more final ode to joy for Steven Seagal and his ridiculousness. He's getting ready for the final showdown between not Rutger Hauer and curly hair guy. He's yeah. dispatched everyone else. And there's just a few no-name goons left and he's like get down there and keep him busy while i give a grenade to this girl and the guy's like fuck it yeah let's do it <laughs> he runs down there to kill him comes around the corner steven seagull goes into a six by six room that is <laughs> yeah. all the space there is in the room there is no cut in between he walks into the room the man sprays the gun into the room there is nothing and no one in the room. And Seagal is now behind him out in the fucking hall beating his ass. How yeah. the fuck did this just happen? These train cars have some interesting physics. I'll just tell you that. Okay, I'm going to try to explain it. I know it's bullshit. I guess the movie's trying to infer that he might have gone around the outside. But, like, he must have been, like, some fucking spider monkey on Mountain Dew. Because, like, it <laughs> happened in, like, fucking four seconds. And he was just there. Now we have Final Showdown coming. And... We get such a line that made me go, okay, finally, finally, somebody else in the movie fucking knows what movie they're in and doesn't give a shit. Curly hair guy talking to not Roger Howard. The guy's like, ah, I'm going to get Ryback. Ryback is mine. He goes, hurry up and go get your throat ripped out. I'll be over here blowing up a billion people. Yeah, <laughs> he's just so nonchalant. Listen, we both know where this is headed. Let's just, let's just do it. Let's just pull that <laughs> Yes, yes. That's another reason why I love that guy, because he's so just self-aware. Like, he read the script, and he's just like, ah, saw the paycheck. All right, let's give it the, let's give it the old one, too. All right, yeah, I, I guess this is what I'm signing up for. I guess this is what I'll do. All right, uh, yeah. He hasn't seen the movie, but he saw the 98 Toyota Corolla it paid for. <laughs> I mean, that's good Toyota enough. Corolla. Good enough for me. Christ. Hmm. Well, cut back to Steven Seagal. Like, he finally squares up with uh, not Rutger Hauer. And t I'm taking it from, like, your thing, Brady. Like, there is a moment just like Commando where, like, they, they look at each other lovingly, I think, for, like, five minutes. <laughs> I think. And bad guy pulls out a knife, and Steven Seagal's like, nah, man, this is a knife, man. And then, boom, the knife fight. 
But it's like it's not even a traditional knife fight. It's like it's like knivesies slapsies. <laughs> like they yes. both really wanted it to be a sword fight with their dicks, but you know that would elevate it up to like an NC seventeen, and that wouldn't sell. So, <laughs> I mean, I think this barely fucking sold. <laughs> Dude, I <laughs> love this scene though. Just catching more and more and more of his fight scenes that are just blatantly looped. Yeah. And when he escalates this and goes into the killer instinct, ultra combo. <laughs> it's just so good. Yeah, it's just like slapping, but it's like not even full punches because like he doesn't even like use his shoulder or anything. Like there's no momentum to this fight scene. It's just him slapping the shit out on Rod Rutger Hauer and he somehow gets him in a headlock and he bounces him off the counter, breaks his neck. Look, after four fucking movies, he has a winner of a line. Yeah. yeah. Finally. Nobody beats me in the kitchen. Nobody puts me in the corner, motherfucker. <laughs> yes! Nobody <laughs> puts the goal in a booby trap car where I get shot up. I'm invincible. And then he just <laughs> then he just snaps his neck. By the way, during all this, if we need to remind you again, he was shot in the shoulder with a sniper rifle. You call that shot? <laughs> Dude, yes! <laughs> Fuck! I can't even yes. say it. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Like, who wrote... If he's even ad-libbing, who went, yes, leave that in? You think that's getting shot? You think that's shot? Yes. <laughs> yes! It's oh, a it, simple, plain answer. Like, if it were, like, super meta, like, hey, man, you call that shot? Let me show you shot. He blows the poor porter away. Like, See, now that's being shot. Why are you sleeping? They just... Oh, no. Like, for the meta. He, like, blows him away. Like, boom! And the fucking dude just explodes. Like, fucking a 50-gallon <laughs> drum of, of juice. And then, Can... in the next scene, he's standing there, like, shook. Like, oh, my God. He says, that's how you blow somebody away. And he's like, what happened? Dude, Steven Seagal has to spend the rest of the movie covered in guts and just, what the fuck ever? Just red mist. Yes. Yes. Zero acknowledgement, though. Zero. Only from the other people, like he, you know, he walked into the final room with the curly haired bad guy just covered in viscera. And the, he's, oh. and the bad guy like turns around and he's about to, you know, say something smart to him. And he just looks at his, oh, oh my, oh fuck, you good? So what you're saying is we need Steven Seagal in Dead Alive 2? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Dude, Steven Seagal with a lawnmower. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, what's it, uh, what are they called? Uh, I'm just the landscaper. Yes! <laughs> Yes. yes. Fuck. <laughs> Unfortunately, like we had to talk about the end of this movie, though. <laughs> yeah. well, no, there's there is <laughs> one. Combo. Yeah, <laughs> there is one little cute thing that happens. Cute. Uh, like, okay, all that we have left is the not Paul Reiser nerdy character with his laptop, and he's about to get away. You know, there's no way to stop it. The trains are gonna collide. We're gonna make an explosion, and then we're gonna kill eight million people in DC. And he's just like, oh, there's no way I can stop it. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Then he shoots the laptop, and he's like, oh, I can't do that. I didn't think of that. And <laughs> I literally looked at the missus. I was just like, "Womp." It's bad. Dude, it's, it's real bad. Right after that happens, it's so fucking abruptly, two trains collide. And <laughs> he's just running inside of a colliding, destroyed train. Fire is racing. Another train is ripping through cars directly at him. They're on a bridge. Shit is spilling off. Fire yeah. is everywhere, and he slides through the smallest opening, and it's like, the hostages are saved. <laughs> you go, what? <laughs> yeah, he's on the phone or whatever with uh, with the Pentagon, and he, he barks back, the hostages are safe. How are they safe? Well, I mean, we discussed a little bit before the cast. There is a very small, very small scene where they decouple the train, or decouple the train, and, like, you know... They're in dark territory chilling, I guess. But I feel like <laughs> Steven Seagal just forgot about them after a while. Well, like... The... <sighs> hey, it doesn't matter. What matters is that Steven Seagal was like, Yeah, I saw the Indiana Jones. I, I need to fucking run from <laughs> something, too. <laughs> Alabama Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, when you want to wear his fedora, you ain't touching my fucking chevron, dude. <laughs> oh. He's like, uh, oh man, you got me cooking cakes. Why'd it have to be cakes? Nice, oh. nice, nice, nice. From there though, like the movie is just over. But like they yes. have to have like this sense of like, oh yeah, like he saved his family per se. So let's have a 
cute moment in the cemetery while some fucking blues starts playing it for no reason. so abruptly. It's like massive explosions, trains going everywhere. He just barely gets out. Cut to one final scene of him standing there with his niece at Arlington Cemetery, like looking at the grave of his brother. No words said. Credits roll. Yeah, like they're legitimately standing there staring off into space. And like he doesn't even have like a hand on her shoulder to console because that's his, that's her pop like, in the ground in front of him. And they're just like, hey, remember that time I killed a train? <laughs> yes! Yes! <laughs> I fucking killed a train. It's, it's the name of this movie. <laughs> Steven Seagal versus Train. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, there was a lot of other convoluted stuff that we didn't get into involving the Pentagon and, oh, the the satellite could be on, like, 18 different tracks or something like that. We gotta narrow it down. None of that shit matters. All that matters no. is... Steven Seagal is a bad motherfucker. <laughs> Ooh, beautiful. And he still has that bullet wound in his shoulder like it never healed. He just bleeds. Oh, my God. He's sitting there at the at the fucking uh, grave site with the niece. He's like, your dad, he's one dead motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, oh, is man. Gonna, this is going to be a bitch when I have to go through airport security. It's a good thing I haven't done 9-11 yet. Oh, oh my what? god. Did he just admit to that versus on a camera? Tray towers? <laughs> oh, holy shit. Well, I assume if he can do it on a train, he can do it on a plane. Here's the question, though. Here's the real question. He is in, is that Air Force One, Eric, where he's immediately killed? Uh, executive decision with Kurt Russell. Executive decision. Bro, if you guys haven't seen that, Steven Seagal is getting ready to go from one plane to another plane via this like uh, sealed room and they're Navy SEALs. And you're like, oh, fuck, it's Casey Ryback all over again. And then everyone goes, no, we want this to be a good movie. Kill him right there. <laughs> do you yeah, think, he, some, do you think he thought he was in the whole movie? From what I remember, like hearing stories from production, like they like he and Kurt Russell were supposed to be like co-leads you know this mm -hmm. is kind of like a, a star vehicle per se mm -hmm. but like he was such a complete piece of garbage there's like no nah, listen like we'll give you like half of what we owe you and we're gonna write you out of this movie and he's just like fuck it whatever i just think they might have given him like a completely different script and then it's just like no nope, you're good uh you know go home for the day he's not coming i think back. there was there was definitely an executive decision made there mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah just to cut his ass out yeah they're like no okay so yo Straight up, this movie is the most ridiculous fucking Seagull vehicle I have seen. Not just in the start, but the way it culminates in the fucking end. If I could look up the definition, the literal representation of the word unbelievable, it would have this film's box art right there. <laughs> this, uh, I, I have to agree. This is just absolutely ridiculous. Like, I know the rest of the movies we did were just ridiculous, but this one in particular has like a flair of an actual movie and i still stand by my theory like you know they were making two movies separately like they're making bad guy movie and they were just making seagal movie just like by himself and a dude following him around the camera unfortunately those two movies have to just collide for an ending that is so fucking dumb that is just so <laughs> fucking dumb it's amazing holy shit <laughs> It's like that I was violently entertained. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like, never watch any Steven Seagal movie looking for a good time. Never watch a Steven Seagal movie looking for perfection or art. These things are just movies that are just hijacked by Steven Seagal vanity projects. And they're just crammed together in the worst possible way. But the baby it produces gives us these bubbles of absurdity that almost supersede entertainment. Yeah. Um, now we. This is our fourth film in Segaluary, and I've I've come to the conclusion that there is some sort of a scale that we work with throughout this month. There's like how much of an actual movie is this, and how <laughs> how ridiculous is this? This is the highest number of ridiculousness with the lowest amount of actual moviedom, because. This is kind of the polar opposite to me of what Under Siege 1 was. Which Under Siege 1, you've got you've got some characters in there. That that was a real actual ass movie. And this movie is just actual ass. 
Okay. That's good. <laughs> but no, it is more ridiculous than any of the other three. But I feel like it's also trying a little bit less than everything else is to capture what actual Hollywood is going for. You know, this is not a good movie, but it's a comedic representation of what a movie could be. Well, there you have it. That was Under Siege 2, Dark Territory, which wraps up Segulliwary. If you have any strong feelings about the show or the movie, leave it in the comment section below. Please make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Be sure to hit the little bell icon, too, so you don't miss what we've got brewing up next. Get out there and follow us on social media, you guys. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. If it's a thing, we're probably there. If you don't give us a listen, we're going to send Casey right back after you. And I swear to God, he will cram so much fucking user content down your throat. That when you're done, he's going to be like, these guys are some bad motherfuckers. We all know that. <laughs> oh.